Silicon Valley uh, looking at hardware startups to say, hey, uh, what are interesting hardware startups that may uh, apply to the automotive sector? And I basically <coughs> source companies and ideas uh, for the company to pursue further. Now, on the other side of the equation, I also love engaging with startups. Um, and, um, you know, early stage startups tend to have interesting ideas, but they don't uh, have necessarily the experience or the means to scale them. And, uh, you know, as a senior executive uh, with a lot of consumer software background, that's, that's kind of where I jumped in. And um, one of the assignments I have right now is with Lumo Body Tech, and you'll hear more about Lumo a little bit later. Um, but that is a hardware startup um, that was formed about three years ago. And uh, I was, uh, I basically helped out as an executive advisor at the beginning, uh, COO uh, on an interim basis between um, the uh, seed stage and series A. And uh, you know, this was when, at the time when there were maybe just four people in a room, uh, the, the founders and I, and we were trying to figure out how we're gonna get a hard piece of hardware into the hands of consumers. So I wanna share a little bit. Uh, some of the things I've learned as a software guy um, trying to make that happen. And you know that experience kind of informed the panel. I think you'll find uh, there's probably uh, a, a bunch of reasons uh, I'm connected with the panelists because um, they're all part of the story of, uh, of putting uh, Lumo Body Tech together. Um, now, uh, there is room, uh, just a shameless plug here, there is room at Hill 88 new projects. So if you're a corporate that wants to connect with Silicon Valley startups or a startup that has interesting uh, idea that is, uh, wants to get some advice on scaling, come talk to me after the meeting. And I'm sure my panelists will have some famous plugs as well. So I will move on. Um, now a year ago, I led a panel, um, a little bit over a year ago in June of 2012, on wearable devices, hype, or health. And uh, if you had a chance to actually go there, you would have had a glimpse into the future. You wouldn't have been caught by surprise uh, about the next wave of computing. Uh, because we, of course, all concluded that wearable devices are helpful. And these were the panelists that attended. And just sort of to give you a glimpse for what's happening and how this is contributing to the rise of the startup, uh, you know, how uh, these different companies actually all have a good degree of success and traction. So Fitbit um, just announced, I think, a $43 million uh, funding round, and, and they now have a rumored valuation of $300 million. Um, Lark has raised another round of funding, I think it's around $3 million this year. They've introduced uh, another product, so they're well on their way. Um, the company I was associated with, Lumoback, is um, has, uh, introduced successfully their first product, has raised a C round, uh, Series A round, and has actually just this week announced a success, uh, successful launch of, an, of a, a follow-on product. Now, I would say the only guy that's maybe not quite so happy yet is Skip Fleshman um, on the venture side. Um, I think uh, none of these uh, wearable device startups, at least that I know of, have had uh, a big exit yet, you know, so that's still coming. But I think the traction is definitely happening out there. So um, things are definitely more successful than they were last year. Now, again, I wanted to share some thoughts before we talk to the panelists about the challenges, because I want to sort of bring everybody up to speed on what are some of the challenges uh, when you are contemplating starting a hardware startup. And you know, again, I'm a software guy. So I knew about the first two bullets on this list. Uh, you got to develop some software. You got to of course, have a nice user interface and, and uh, do some graphics. Um, but if you look at the list, doing a hardware startup is just a whole other order of complexity larger, right? You, there, not only do you have to worry about the client software, but you also have to worry about the firmware on the, on the processor. You've got to get yourself an electrical engineer that can do the circuit design. Um, and you want someone experienced that knows how to do commercial uh, circuit design, uh, not, you know, not a student or something like that that will make uh, mistakes that will haunt you for a long time. Um, you got to start thinking about the form factor, the, the housing, right? That um, 
uh, and consumers like to see a certain level of design. They want uh, interesting uh, things to look at and feel, different materials. Um, once you've accomplished all that, there's all kinds of considerations you have to make for manufacturing. Is it easy to manufacture, or is it just going to be a real bear, and it all of a sudden you know, creates a giant labor cost issue for you, or a huge defect issue because the manufacturer can't put this ingenious device that you came up with together uh, properly. You know, another big revelation I had at Lumo back, I thought all I needed to do was find one manufacturer. But you know, it turns out I had to find at least two. I think I ended up with like three because um, uh, not only do I need to worry about assembly uh, and component assembly and final assembly, but hey, somebody needs to build the plastic housing or, uh, yeah. So, you know, that's a whole other uh, manufacturer that you need to qualify. Those skills are generally not in the exact same house. And then the third, I had to uh, find a kidder of uh, somebody that actually did the packaging. Um, and packaging by itself is a whole nother experience because you need to think about what are you going to put on the packaging, how, how is it constructed, um, sir, uh, does the packaging, is it strong enough to uh, survive shipment all over the world? There are a lot of standards out there. And uh, then you get to certifications. Um, a lot of these hardware devices tend to have transmit and receiving functions. And that involves government agencies where you need to meet FCC standards. Um, you may want to test for waterproofness, skin allergies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And last but not least, and I would say this was another big revelation. I figured, well, I know how to do FedEx, so that can't be very hard. But uh, logistics and warehousing and uh, putting bringing your components together is a whole other art form. So. Um, you know, the bottom line is, I think you're looking at at least an order of magnitude and complexity than just, you know, uh, building an app that you're going to deliver on the App Store. Um, but the other big challenge is risk. And, uh, um, you know, this is something we keep thinking about also at Lumobag. Um, you know, in software, if you're just selling software, it's great to have a great quarter or to have a quarter surprise where you say, hey, Guess what? We sold twice as many as we thought we would sell uh, units of software. We have a, this great quarter. Well, as a hardware startup, that doesn't work. Um, you have to make decisions months and months in advance on how many you're going to build. And that's what you're going to sell, right? That's your upside. That's your, your best case scenario. Whatever you build, you're going to sell. That's your revenue. Like, there's not going to be a surprise where all of a sudden you make twice as much. So you have to be really careful. Um, about figuring out ordering just the right amount, but also you got to worry about the downside, um, the landfill, if you build too many, because these technologies become quickly out of date. And that's, uh, I don't know if you see that picture of the Atari 2600. I don't know if there's uh, many of you in the room that remember, but I think we buried uh, several million of these in a, in a landfill in Santa Clara. Uh, it, it was a famous game for the Atari 2600 that for some reason just did not take hold. And I think a lot of VCs still remember that Atari 2600, and they've uh, you know, pledged to never have it happen again to them, where their money has basically been sunk into a landfill because uh, too many were built and not enough were sold. So risk is something you're constantly thinking about in the hardware startup business, uh, thinking about how long your components are going to take to deliver. Some take three months or longer. Uh, thinking about your manufacturing line, is there availability to build your product, especially at the lower volumes? Um, you know, you're not an Apple, let's face it, so um, if Apple calls and says I need 20 million units built, guess, guess who loses? It's your little startup that is maybe just building 5,000 or 10,000 units. And um, volume discounts kick in in different layers, so it becomes sort of a complex game where you try to figure out, am I building 25,000 or 5,000? Because I can get a much better price for 25,000. Um, and then there's the Kool-Aid factor. So startups in general, you know, we, we all like to live in this reality distortion zone, and I think the CEO generally tends to be the, the biggest, per, uh, uh, I call it the, uh, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid kind of deal, where the, the the CEO tries to keep that story together in terms of how successful the startup's going to be. 
and that will run, run smack dab in, in, into the realities of sales. How many are you really selling? And how many should you build? Like how much money should you put out, given all this risk, uh, for, the, for the Christmas season, for example? And that may be very different from the Kool-Aid experience that your CEO is having right now, right? So there's always this, uh, this tension. All right, let's see. Third challenge, the channel. Um, you may think you've made it when these happy people at the Apple Store have uh, decided to sell your product for you. But there's another rude awakening there because um, retail is a real downer. So if you sell something at $100 um, at retail, you really only get 50 of that. And you're lucky to get about 50 of that. And, and this is sort of the rule in manufacturing, um, 150, 25. Um, basically, you want to keep your cost of goods, all the components and the labor costs for you to build and package the product, should be about 25% of your selling price. If it's higher, you're going to have problems. Um, and uh, uh, it generally, as a startup, you're dealing at such low volumes and higher costs, it, it's tough to get into uh, delivering for $100, you know, a, a something that a consumer thinks is worth $100, delivering that and paying only $25 in, in components costs. It's just tough. Um, maybe um, some of you have figured it out. Uh, and then there's all kinds of channel issues. You, you, you know, unlike software, where you just publish something on the on the on the mm -hmm. app store, you're done. If uh, if there's a bug you find, well, you just publish an update to the app. Done, no problem. Um, if you've got product out all over the world, either at resellers, sitting in Apple stores, and you need to do an update, it looks uh, a lot tougher than dealing with defects, having a product sent back. Worrying about um, retailers hate to run out of stocks, that's another big problem. And then um, just maintaining your retail price is a problem. You, you, you're constantly worried that there's some reseller out there that's going to take advantage. And you know, you may have a $149 selling price. For some reason, this person thinks they're going to sell it for $110 and ruin the party for everybody. And that's the fastest way to get those people at Apple that are looking so smiley to frown and uh, kick you out of the Apple store. OK, so why do it? Boy, I gave you all the reasons why this, uh, this business really sucks. It's a very complex business. And um, I think this is the main reason why. And we were looking at this from a Lumoback perspective as well. Uh, originally, our idea was, just like everybody else, is, hey, we're going to sell a subscription. We're going to do the software. You know, the hardware is just a means to an end. You know, it's like the ink cartridges for printers. Let's just break even on the hardware. We're going to make money on the software. And then we started to look at this and said, you know what? No one's making money in software anymore. The consumer, you know, what, what is really the value that a consumer values for, the, for an app? And uh, the average price is uh, an App Store app is 19 cents. Uh, not a whole lot of money there to be made. The cool thing is consumers still value these little gadgets at a fairly good price point, $100 or more. So a lot of these hardware devices that are smart, that are selling, um, you, 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 there's, a, there's a good amount of money at play. Retailers like it too. It's a, it's a good markup for them. Um, so that's definitely a reason. And, and really, at Lumo back, we, we shifted our approach. And you'll see a lot of the hardware startups do the same thing now. They really actually love selling hardware because it gives you uh, a good amount of revenue. Um, and the software now is the commodity that just helps <coughs> enable it. Um, the other thing, all the things that I mentioned on the risk side are all barriers to entry. So you're less likely to, to get kicked out by a guy in a garage uh, uh, or in his bedroom with a, with a Mac that's building another app, right? Um, there are a lot of things that you learn about doing a hardware startup. Once you've learned it, once you've sort of gotten off the ground, you're, you're going to be very valuable, and it's going to be very difficult for somebody else to, to jump in. OK, um, a couple of more slides, and then we'll turn things over to the uh, uh, panelists. So this is a slide that Mary Meeker presented a few months ago. Uh, I mean, she's kind of gotten to the point where uh, she's looking at wearable devices everywhere computing as the next technology cycle, as important as the invention of the PC, uh, 
desktop internet computing and mobile computing. So you know that's that's massive. So I think from an investor perspective, there is starting to become a wave of interest. Um, and uh, one other slide I wanted to show you. It's a little complex, but um, I found this. This just came out this week from a blogger named Rene Deresta. Um, I found it through Startup Digest. But this plots all the hardware startups and how much money they raised um, over the last couple of years. And uh, the thing that I can't really see, but uh, the highlighted thing on the bottom right corner is the funding events year to date is 47. And the total amount of money raised is about $223 million. And that is already more than the entire uh, last year. So uh, at least in this first six months, uh, according to Renee's research, um, we are uh, doing quite well. More and more money, investment money, is going into hardware startups. And even Dilbert is on board with the wearable device revolution. I just saw this while I was preparing the slides early this morning. This is today's Dilbert. The only thing missing is the Google back brand on that. It's in good shape. So that's all I had to say, and now I will turn things over to our esteemed panelists. I'm really excited about uh, the panelists and the discussions <laughs> I've had with them. They all were picked to bring a unique viewpoint, um, and uh, I, I've asked them all to present a couple of slides that gives you an introduction to their backgrounds and uh, the kinds of trends that they're seeing. And uh, we'll start with Scott. Right. Am I talking from here or over there? Uh, over there, and take one of those mics. All right. Working? Yes. Yes. Everybody hear me? Wow. Yep. All right. Um, so, uh, let's see, about 10 years ago, um, my partner Ray Oliver and I started a, a hobby, um, which was helping people make things. And it turned out most of the people were making things at that time in, in Asia, um, split sort of between Taiwan and China. And uh, we turned it, uh, a couple of years later, we turned it from a hobby into a real business, um, which we call Zaotech. And uh, shall I cue you to the flip slide then? Okay. okay. And so the gist of, of what we do in, in one slide is, is this. Um, basically, uh, if you think about how you develop hardware, you sort of start from need finding or um, identifying something that, that needs to be solved. And so you start developing a, a solution around maybe how it looks and, and what your concept is, and, and eventually you get to making a rough prototype. And eventually you have to go from this lovely, fun, researchy world of prototypes to actually commercialization. And that's, that's really where we come in is um, we help companies, um, you can, yeah, there you go. Um, we help sort of companies uh, get from prototype into mass production. Um, and we do this through a whole lot of hands-on engineering uh, support. Um, we have a team in an office in southern China, uh, and also some capability in Taiwan. Um, and we basically do the dirty work uh, to help our clients uh, get from having that prototype into mass production. So that involves doing some engineering work. Uh, it involves a whole lot of work around this concept we call NPI, which is new product production to manufacturing. Um, that deals with everything from designing the mold and, and getting good parts made um, for, say, the mechanical housing, to getting circuit boards tested uh, at the end of a production line, possibly with uh, custom-created uh, uh, test software. So that's, that's really our niche, is um, bridging the world of really brilliant people that come up with great concepts um, uh, into, uh, into mass production. You can go to zotech.com and, and see our website to, to learn a whole lot more. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, some of the trends that I see in um, hardware that are creating this rise of the hardware startup that, that we're talking about tonight. I think one of the most important things that's happened recently is this um, commoditization of really good quality sensors and wireless uh, chips. <coughs> this is a huge difference from 10 years ago, where uh, an accelerometer 10 years ago was never going to end up in a consumer product because, um, first of all, it was way too large in, uh, in terms of its package size. Uh, secondly, it was way too expensive. But the cool thing is today you can get, you know, last decade's NASA-grade chips that um, are slightly bigger than a speck of dust and uh, consume you know, uh, microwatts or millo low milliwatts of power, and you can do some amazing things. And so what that has risen, has led to, um, 
besides devices that are more interesting and more interactive, um, and certainly able to sense the user or the environment, um, is at least devices that can actually have a social element. So, 10 years ago, we made hardware and it was sort of interacting with on a one, one by one basis. And today, you can have devices um, which, either through social networking or through their own connectivity to the internet, actually bring a social element. Um, into that hardware experience. And that's a big, big differentiator that um, a lot of companies are starting to take advantage of. So you can have you know, your uh, posture sensor or your activity tracker, and you can turn it into a social game, right? Who has better posture, you or your friends, or who you know, walked more steps yesterday or burned more calories? Um, and that's really all I mean by that. Um, another interesting factor is those 3D prototyping. It's, it's all the rage, it's all over the news. Um, What's notable here is that you've got much better um, materials than you had before, so you have a much wider variety of materials with much, with much better properties. Um, the cost of those materials and the machines that, that you feed them through to make your prototypes is coming down dramatically. So the innovation cycle is, is both sped up and the quality of the early innovation cycle is improved because you're getting much better prototypes for much lower cost than you used to get. Um, and I think the third big factor here, and, and everybody else is also aware of this, is what I call crowd engagement, everybody else calls it crowdfunding, but I think it's not about the funding, it never should be, um, except from a cash flow perspective in terms of your first, uh, first order of production. Um, but Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and the rest, and now there's even starting to be startups that, that will sell you your own uh, uh, crowd uh, funding uh, software package so you don't have to pay the 5% to Kickstarter. Um, this, is, this is a really, really powerful tool, and again, it's not about the money, it's about the fact that now you can do a beta test of a product or a focus group, and instead of having 10 or 20 people in a room in a focus group like we had 15 years ago, you can have 500 or 1,000 or 20,000, and they all pay, which is phenomenal, instead of having to, to pay to, to run the focus group. So um, this kind of really intimate customer engagement um, allows you to have this large-scale beta and to get a whole lot of feedback, not to mention that feedback is all public. And so if you're successful, everybody knows about it. So venture capitalists are way more, or angels are way more excited about investing in you if you have documented interest in your product, right? And documented interest in the form of, I just sold $2 million worth of product on Kickstarter is way more powerful than, I did a survey with SurveyMonkey and I got 47 of my, of my business school friends to respond, and 46 of them said they want it, right? So um, the, the ability to sort of do this beta testing and also, um, <coughs> Uh, refine uh, your messaging, how you're going to uh, describe the product. It's just an incredibly powerful uh, tool or uh, hardware entrepreneur to have. So this creates interesting opportunities, right? Um, both the opportunity to create a new category, like wearables, um, that didn't exist before, um, and the opportunity to, to disrupt markets, right? And uh, Things like Nest Labs is probably the most famous disruptor of a market. Um, again, it's totally enabled by some of the things that we talked about a moment ago. Um, if you don't have cheap sensors and, and wireless communication and you can package into a product that sells for 100 to 200 bucks, you can't, you can't disrupt Honeywell's business, right? Um, and Stefan alluded to sort of this concept of software and, um, and geez, are you selling software? Or are you selling hardware? Or are you really selling software but just putting it into a pretty box that people will actually value and pay for, right? And so a very high percentage of the companies that we work with, I would argue, are fundamentally software or service companies. But they have figured out that people will pay more for it if we put it into an interesting novel design box and put a circuit board in it and make it connect on its own. Um, but you got to remember, even if it's, you're still selling software in, in a pretty box, it's still hardware. And it's called hardware <laughs> for a reason, okay? <laughs> Um, and all you have to do is look on Kickstarter at the litany of projects that don't ship on time, and you understand that hardware is still hard. So um, I know Stefan will also um, beat this drum as well, and I'm sure Mike will, will as well. Oh, yeah. um, but I think the other opportunity here is that all these things together give us this opportunity to develop and, and launch hardware in a very different manner than we did five or certainly ten years ago, where. Today you can almost put things into beta, right? Everybody remembers Gmail came out and it was in beta for how many years, right? Well, now products, hardware products are going out in beta and the reason is because the experience is primarily coming from the firmware and software that runs on the device. So if you build a really good box to start, you can actually add a whole lot of features very quickly and 
transparent to the user, right? So that really changes, I think, the amount of time and the dollars that are needed to build a hardware startup. 20 years ago, you had to prove that the box is perfect, it works flawlessly, and people want it. And today you say, the box mostly works, and in the next six months, I'm going to release this, this, and this feature. And suddenly, this box that costs $200 is going to be worth $500 to people, right? And so that, that changes your, uh, your launch strategy as well. Um, we can talk more about this. I think you know manufacturing and setting up the supply chain is really, really important. You need to match your supply chain to who you are, as Stefan said. As a startup, you're not Apple. You don't want to go to Foxconn. You know you might want to go see Ken over at Sonic Manufacturing. Um, that said, there are certain kinds of products that are really good to make in the U.S. There are others that make a lot more sense to make in Asia. Um, and there's no one size fits all. There's no standard recipe. Um, and in our business, we spend a whole lot of time to understand your business and what you're trying to do with your business and also with the, the engineering attributes of your project so that we can decide where is a sensible place to, to make it. Right? Um, there's a whole other side of, of a challenge in setting up a hardware business, especially when you're primarily selling a software or a service, which is setting up a hardware business is very different than setting up a software business um, from everything that Stefan talked about. from how you create it to how you deliver it, right? The fulfillment and the sales aspect. And um, it's, a, it's a very important thing to think about. And, and we, in Zyotech, spend some of our time, um, both myself and one of my partners, Jim, who's out in the audience there tonight, um, advising startups on this aspect of building a company and building a framework for actually delivering product and being in business. Because whether you're doing e-commerce fulfillment or brick and mortar fulfillment, um, it's a really important aspect of your business that needs to be thought about first because you only get one chance to make a first impression and uh, live up to your customers' expectations. So, we uh, alluded to the, the launch and distribution here a bit. Um, as uh, Stefan said, as a startup, you should really think twice if you think you need to go into retail. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of good reasons not to, and uh, the margin structure is but merely one of them. And, you probably have a whole a whole uh, presentation or panel on, on that topic alone. Um, I always bring up this thing to uh, to entrepreneurs: um, this this risk of valley myopia. Um, it's easy to think I'm designing this widget and people are willing to pay me three hundred dollars for it, and maybe you should ask some people in the Midwest if they would pay three hundred dollars for it, because you might find that it's different than what the demographics of the Bay Area will will shell out. So. Um, there's a lot to consider. I mean, this is just a, a, I wanted to touch on a couple, you know, things here, and, and we'll talk more about it, I'm sure, either during this or, or afterwards, feel free to approach me. All right, thank you, Scott. And next, I uh, want to introduce Mike Pierce. He has a special place in my heart, uh -huh. because um, when uh, Lumobac uh, got a Series A funding, we decided to hire a real professional um, uh, head of manufacturing. So Mike has inherited all my mistakes, and he's worked very hard to uh, reverse them. And uh, so, like I said, Mike, thank you for taking over. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Lumo. Well, for the record, they, they weren't all mistakes because you hired Scott and Ken. So that's, that's a couple <laughs> of good starts right there. But, um, so yeah, as Stefan uh, mentioned, I'm the head of manufacturing for Lumo. Um, I think that the question is, what does that mean? Um, it doesn't mean that I'm in charge of going to the factory and making sure they build it right. What it means is, and this is what I like to tell people I'm doing for a long time, I'm in charge of getting your product in the door. And that door could be your warehouse, or that door could be your retailer, or that door could be your customer's house. Um, but everything from you give me the design and you give me the prototype to I get it into the door. And that's what I've been doing for, uh, for the last uh, several years, and I think I'm a little unique in the room, certainly on the panel, in that I've made almost everything <laughs> in one way or another. So I actually started my, my career in the lowest tech business you can think of. I started making furniture, and uh, from there I moved to consumer products, and that could be anything from a coaster that you put your glass on all the way up to we actually built an e-reader um, a few years ago. And so uh, there's, there's certainly unique challenges that, that come with making anything. Um, but I think that what we're talking about today, technology and wearable technology, is specifically challenging because, as Scott alluded to, and I'm sure Ken will tell you, is that there's so many more moving parts. You know, If you're making a coaster, you just make sure the coaster doesn't have chips and nicks, and out the door you go. Um, but there's a lot more moving parts. You have to make sure that it looks good, it works well, 
um, and everything, specifically dealing with hardware, right, that everything on the board talks to each other. Uh, we all have more stories about that. Um, so, shameless plug. Um, we just, uh, thank you very much, I don't have to take mine off. Um, we, uh, just this week, we've introduced our second generation. Um, Lumo is a, uh, is a wearable body sensor you wear around your, uh, your midsection, and we, will, we help you track your posture. Uh, we will we help you track your posture sitting and standing. Uh, we can also help you track your sleep. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it. We're also an activity tracker, um, and we've built what we believe the most advanced biomechanical model in the world on the device. Thank you to the guy sitting in the front row right there. We helped us do that. Um, and uh, it's, uh, we released the 3.0 version of the app as well as the, the, the 2.0 version of the sensor. So we'll move back to that comment if you guys so. Shameless plug aside, I'll be short. Sure. I just want to talk a little bit about me uh, before we get into the discussion so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, so, previous position, I work for a, a, uh, a wholesale supplier of consumer goods. Um, you've never heard of us, but if you ever bought a Discovery Kids product, an Animal Planet product, or Sharper Image product, I made that. Well, not actually me, I got factories to make it, um, but you're welcome and I'm sorry at the same time. Uh, <laughs> so, I was going to stand up so I can read a little better. I learned as they went to work. Um, so, previous position, I was managing development and production for over 250 separate SKUs a year. That doesn't include color variations or specific variations for retailers and or packaging, which, let me tell you, when you start dealing with retailers, there's lots of those of the latter. Um, last in the year, 2012, uh, my last year at the company, we shipped 45 million separate pieces of product to every major retailer in the country, except Costco, because boy, that's tough to get into. Um, but boy, you're happy when you're in. Uh, and uh, I managed a team of 12 people in the U.S. who are unusually lean um, for that, uh, and I managed a team of 70 on the ground in China. So I'm not doing that to talk about how good I am at stuff. I'm talking about that to transition to what I'm doing now. So currently, um, we manage the, manage the development and production of much less than 250 SKUs. Like I said, we introduced version 2.0 this week. <laughs> uh, as much as I, I want to believe it, we're not going to ship 45 million pieces this year. Maybe next year. Next year. Um, and actually, as, as Scott and, and Stephanie everyone's alluded to, we made the choice not to sell retail um, this year. And the, uh, my team is a team of me. So managing me, um, <laughs> which is harder than I thought. Uh, and so the question is, you know, what is that like? Um, and so I, I think for me, it's been the category of the good, the bad, and the, the good. Um, I made a lot of stuff. If anyone knows the products I'm talking about, that you probably got used for a week and ended up in a landfill. After a while, it makes you feel a little bit bad about yourself. Not that there weren't good products. We made some really good products, but a lot of stuff was stuff that was cheap that, that broke and people threw away. Um, this is where it's at, and we all know this because we're here literally and figuratively, the valley. Um, like Stefan alluded to, the second generation. This is really exciting. I spent the last five years living in Orange County, and I love the beach, but this, this is where the electricity is, and it's been, it's been just tremendous to be here. Um, boy, have I been learning. Oh, boy, have I been learning. Uh, you know, we're doing things, not just in wearable tech, but specifically we're doing things that people haven't done before. Um, and tracking movement the way that we're tracking movement and, and creating something that, that just is, is brand new. Um, and teaching people about that, it's been really exciting. Um, and the people are great. The people I work with um, are tremendous, and the people I meet, and the, the level of collaboration and cooperation between startups here is just incredible. Um, let me tell you, when you're in the consumer products business, no one talks to you about anything. So the fact that you know we can call up people from, I've had conversations with the, the CTO of Orbotics and we had a beer together. I mean, the, the kind of thing that just is, is tremendous. Um, and every day is an adventure, brand new. Every day something's new, you don't know what's waiting for you. Um, the bad, you know, you're fighting up against, you're fighting uphill against larger players for, for mind share, for retail space, for, for manufacturing, um, for component costs, certainly. Uh, getting the vendors not just to talk to you, everybody's going to talk to you, but are they going to listen to you? And are they going to hear you, what you in what you need? And specifically when I talk about that, I mean, when you have a conversation with a vendor, they say, well, you're going to buy 5000 here's your price. What, to get someone to listen to you is for you to be able to say, yeah, I'm buying 5000 now, but you know what, I'm looking for that somebody who's willing to roll the dice on us. And um, getting someone who's willing to do that, and they're out there. Um, I found that they actually are out there and had a lot of luck with that. Um, there's the constant <laughs> unknown. You don't know what's coming tomorrow, and you don't know, are people gonna, are people gonna bite? Um, and then every day's an adventure, is always a challenge. Uh, the ha, huh. so uh, I came from a pretty buttoned up company, um, certainly an older company. 
Um, and so uh, we're, we're a bunch of guys in a room in, on Sherman Ave in Palo Alto. <laughs> it's been challenging to deal with that many people, Seth and smiling, because he knows. You know, one side of the switch room up. is, one side of the room is engineering, up. and uh, it's, been, it's a challenge to, to work that closely and that, that tightly with that many passionate people, but it's, it's been good. Um, learning to work with engineering hours. Um, I've always kind of come in about eight or nine, and we have a guy who shows up at 2.30 every day without fail. I don't know what time he goes home, but he was in at 2.30. Um, I was walking out the door the other night and at 8 o'clock, and the guy next to me asked him, are you going home? He goes, I'm going to go take a nap. 8 p.m., taking a nap. So it's, it's been interesting. Um, and just the absolute breakneck pace, um, I was just not ready for it. Someone just came out with something. Um, someone just got, someone doing something differently. Someone just got funding for something that's, that's absolutely competitive with your product. You gotta move fast now, and you gotta adapt quickly. Um, and so it's exciting, but boy, it's, it's, been, a, it's been an adjustment. Uh, but it's, it's exciting, and obviously, um, I have a, there's a lot more that I'm going to talk about specifically in the space and manufacturing the challenges of that, and we'll do that as we, we get in. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about me and, and, and my, my sort of perspective on this whole thing. So thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, now we move on to Ken. Uh, as you may have surmised, uh, uh, Sonic, we're really uh, grateful for Sonic. Uh, they uh, took uh, the initial little bag production on. Uh, and personally taught me a lot about uh, how to actually manufacture something. So I'll turn things over to Ken to introduce himself. Thanks. Um, my name is Ken Robb. I, I founded, uh, with a couple other people, Sonic Manufacturing Technologies about 17 years ago. We're a U.S.-based only contract manufacturer, uh, headquartered here in Silicon Valley. And our primary mission is uh, uh, to help hardware startups like you guys get to market and then where appropriate, uh, also work on those products into full production. And what I've found uh, over the years in doing that is there's, there's definitely people that need both kinds of approaches. There's people that have a product that absolutely needs to be in Asia when it's in high volume. And those people might meet, need me on the front end to get stuff done very, very quickly and get their first prototypes built, some of their NPI runs done. And then there's other people that for IP reasons or security reasons or reliability reasons or otherwise need to stay with me for the rest of their natural lives, which is maybe disconcerting to them, but they'll get used to me after a while. Um, but we, we tend to touch a lot of different companies. Um, we're not like one of those contract manufacturers. And, oh, I should probably back up a little bit and explain what contract manufacturers do. <coughs> but we don't look for that one big company that's going to be you know, our whole means to success. We probably have at any given time a hundred different clients doing a hundred different exciting things that our challenge is really to support all of them and help their dreams get, get out into production and get sold. And, uh, you know, we have... Um, Tell me when you want the slide advanced. Yeah, this is fine. But, you know, over the years we've actually grown into quite a large company by having <coughs> so many different satisfied clients and being at the epicenter of the innovation over here. Um, contract manufacturers, as you, as you may or may not know, um, we're the people that would build the electronics that is somebody else's idea. So somebody would, if you were think of it as like a contractor who would be building a house, we're just like that contractor, only we're building electronics. So virtually none of the people that are, are making these great hardware startup ideas are actually building their own product anymore. They're going to people like me in the U.S., they may be going to you know, someplace in Asia to make it, but contract manufacturing is what most people do these days. And we, in essence, have to become part of your team to help you succeed. So there's a lot of different interactions that we've had, um, you know, from very early on into later stages of production where, you know, our people and the entrepreneurs are sitting there, you know, at those engineering hours in the middle of the night, figuring out how do you, how do you get this thing into production? How do we get to the next step to meet your goals? And our job is to offer talent, preferably in the areas that the, the startups don't have talent. So as a team, we've got things completely covered. And uh, as you may guess, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a while. My partners are also very experienced. And we love working with everybody's new ideas and getting them out there so that uh, everybody can use them. Um, I'll go to the next one. I, I will put in a little bit of a shameless plug here for bringing jobs back to the USA. I'm not going to say that everything that's uh, in Asia is going to come back here because it's not. 
I'm also not going to say that it even should come back here because it probably shouldn't. But we are working in a global economy, and there are certain things that do belong here, and there are certain advantages that we do have. And no longer can you make a blanket statement and say, if I'm going to do this, I have to do it in Asia, or I have to do it in Mexico, or I have to do it wherever. There are uh, things changing every day out there in the economies as far as transportation costs, labor costs, political factors that may make things a little different than you may have assumed that they are. And my big advice to entrepreneurs is to kick the tires. If you want to see what something really is, quote some people in Asia, quote some people in Mexico, quote us, and see, see where the cutover lines really are in what you're doing. And you know, one of the big challenges that entrepreneurs have is figuring out the costing, staying within your pricing guidelines so you can meet your goals when you're selling the things, engage with your contract manufacturer to really nail that stuff down and to kick the tires early so you know, you know, is this guy's pricing just way off base and these other guys are all great or hey, am I, do I really have a problem here? My pricing's out of line and it's across the board out of line because I'm doing something that's too difficult for the market. Our job is to help you make those decisions and, and figure out the information, you know, and get it in your hands so you know what to do. Um, I do take great pride in having our operations here in the U.S. Um, you know, our, our factory is a smorgasbord of people from everywhere. There uh, is a ton of talent there, and it's a talent that's in a lot of different areas. Um, we're creating jobs in the U.S., and we're doing that because we're competitive. We're not doing that out of sympathy or anything else. I, we, we get jobs because we're the best for the job. If we're not the best for the job, we're not going to get the job. So uh, we can use innovation. We can use automation. We can use technical expertise. We can't use 25 cents an hour labor. But if all those other things are working out OK, we may have a solution for you. Um, yeah, we can. And oh, by the way, let's go back one. I, I didn't point this out, but I, I should point out the lower couple of slides there on the, on the left. Um, a lot of you are engineers. Uh, we're in the same time zone, meaning if you call me at 1 AM, I will answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and everybody on my team will have intense focus and dedication to making things successful. Because one of the interesting things about being a contractor is I'm not selling a product. If the Apple store sells a bunch of the product, my cut on that is actually zero directly from the Apple store. My cut is from making the products and from the people that I'm supporting being successful. So the only way I have continuing business is by helping all of you become successful. And that's the cornerstone of what a contractor, or at least a good contractor, whether it's me or somebody else, ought to be thinking about in doing this. Because if they're not thinking that, they're on the wrong page. Okay. Uh, on trends, uh, I'm, I'm probably at the, uh, a, a little bit at the tail end of some of these things, but I do get a pretty good viewpoint into what people are doing in the markets. Uh, especially what people are saying with respect to wireless devices uh, and network devices, I, it's huge right now. People are coming up with all kinds of products, whether it be you know, posture monitoring or managing your landscape or whatever. The thing that have, a lot of these devices have in common is they all got a wireless element and you can either, either monitor them or control them through some kind of uh, mobile device. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's becoming very, very prevalent. Um, we see a ton of people also doing work in, you could say, green energy, battery management, <coughs> stuff like that. Fair amount of, of, of products coming out in the LED lighting uh, kind of spaces. And uh, one of the nice things about a contract manufacturer being in the front end in Silicon Valley is we get to see a lot of new stuff coming out right when it's coming out. And we can tell what's going to be in Fry's next year. Um, you know, back when HD, HDTV was coming out, we had those in our test stations like a year before Fry's had them, and it was really cool. And uh, it's never a dull moment, believe me. Um, it is a little bit, uh, I guess if I was going to give advice on the hardware side, um, it, it is tough business. Uh, you know, where, where you're doing a software program and managing one thing, you know, any given hardware product may have hundreds of different devices in it. And they all have to come together at the same time. They all have to have the proper quality. They all have to be, be able to be assembled correctly and got out on time. So there's millions of challenges to doing a hardware product. And you need to have really good people that you're working with and good systems to manage that in order to make it be successful. And my own, um, you know, without being derogatory to, to other people that do what I do, most people aren't really all that good at it. I mean, you talk about missed schedules. You know, lack of commitment, an inability to handle the changes, 
you really have to look out for that when you're choosing a partner to work with because everybody says they do it, but do they really do it? Do you know somebody who's worked with somebody who has had an experience with it who can give you the real skinny on what's going on? It's a really big deal because the right contract manufacturing partner can help you guys immeasurably. The wrong contract manufacturing partner can set you back months or kill you. So be very careful in who you're selecting, make sure they have the capabilities, and make sure the management of that company is going to give you the mind share and the attention that you deserve. And if they're not buying into it, find somebody else. Um, local manufacturing, I like to say um, one of the big advantages for hardware startups is when you're working with a local guy, you're probably going to find somebody that's got a mindset that's going to match up pretty well with your own. Everybody here does have a lot of energy and has a lot of commitment, and you want and somebody in Silicon Valley probably matches that pretty well for the most part. Uh, elsewhere around the world, maybe not so much, maybe not so fast. Maybe they don't do it quite the same way. Maybe they don't really understand what you want. Maybe they're trying to fit your round peg into their square hole. Um, so it's, it's really important to have an understanding between the parties who are involved and to get you where you need to go. And uh, you know, you need a good partner for contract manufacturing. And I'd uh, be glad to share you all the fun and the horror stories, uh, maybe during the question and answer, but that's, right. that's kind of what we figured out. That, that period solid. is rapidly running out. So, uh, okay, so I wanted to move on. Thank you, Ken. And uh, I wanted to introduce um, Swain Strobon, and he's probably been wondering, okay, uh, said there's going to be slides. I didn't submit any, but I made one for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks. And, and uh, just as a short introduction, I, um, uh, I've i actually had to look hard to find a VC that's really excited about the hardware space. Um, it, it's still hard uh, It's still hard to, to find, uh, but as we were talking, I really ended up um, getting excited about having Kosla here because you guys are back in a whole bunch of really interesting startups in the hardware space and also in the sustainable space. And I took a little um, intro here just uh, of your portfolio just so people can see what kind of <coughs> you okay. So go ahead. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make this short because I, I think we have a Q&A session, so yep. we probably should get to that. So um, at KB, we are at the very, very front end of all of this. <laughs> Um, people come to us with basically an idea and a team, and um, we are more often than not the first one here. Um, as far as hardware, I want to expand the discussion a little bit. We have only been talking about um, consumer hardware, wearable devices, and so on. Our hardware engagements range from um, things that are wear wearable devices, like we're an investor in Jawbone, Misfit. Um, to um, devices that are much lower tech in a sense because they're basically add-ons to, to, to cell phones, um, cells go for example, um, to really more complicated things like robots in agriculture, that's uh, actually kind of an interesting uh, project I can, I can chat about, um, a slightly new one, uh, robots in food production, um, to all the way, if you want to go all the way to the right on complexity, to uh, observation satellites. So th there is a big variety in hardware that you can do. Um, so far we have been focused mostly on wearable devices and cons consumer devices. And so if, the, if most of the interest is there, um, I'm happy to answer questions question in, in, in that regard. Um, <coughs> I personally have a, a very fond, uh, I'm very fond of robots and uh, robotics. Um, and that kind of explains a few things in the, in the portfolio that I'm, uh, that I'm focused on. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that, and uh, we can we, we can leave it there. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Sven, and uh, I'll give you the first question, which I'm sure everybody is dying to to know, which is all about um, the investment landscape. I mean, uh, I sort of alluded to to maybe hardware startups uh, getting more funding uh, than before. Uh, at the same time, I know whenever I ask. It's, people still say it's really hard to find a VC that's interested. So how would you characterize it? Is it, is it getting better for hardware startups? Is it still absimal? Or, or would you say it's, it's always been good? Well, it certainly hasn't always been good. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that's definitely not true. Um, has it been getting better? I, yeah, I think there's more people who have an interest in, in, in hardware startups and finding hardware startups. But 
um, to when, when I looked at the slides um, and I counted slide titles, I think there were five that said challenges, and I, I think there were. I, I don't remember one that said opportunity. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, that, that, that might be a hint. Um, but, um, uh, but, but I think uh, people are more willing to take, the, to take these uh, risks now just because a few of the, the, the core items have become a little bit cheaper. So um, some of the things you can do as add-on devices to, to, to mobile devices, you need the brain and maybe even capture a lot of the sensors on the, on the phone that can be a much, much lower cost app. Um, there has been this recognition that you need to have an investment thesis in different areas of these hardware devices. So I think the investor community is slowly catching up and starting to be a little bit more sophisticated about it. But let me give you one concrete example. So um, I see a lot of companies that are building games physical games for, for, for kids. And it takes a while for you to develop an investment thesis of what game should you invest in and why this and not that. And you begin to realize very quickly, well, I mean, I have two kids, but there's an audience of two. This is not a valid way to, to, to look at this. Um, and you begin after a while to, to have a, a set of metrics behind this. So how good is the replay value, for example, for a, for a toy like that in the, in, in the testing? I think the investment community very slowly is getting to hone thesis in different verticals. So for, for toys, for, for, for wearables, um, for uh, robotics applications, and so on. So I, I, I think slowly the investment community is kind of catching up and it's definitely getting a little better. OK, one other follow-up question on the investment side. Um, if I'm a hardware startup and I'd like to get money from Kosla, you know, what kinds of things do you look for uh, Given the complexity, um, do you already want to see a you know like sort of a head of manufacturing on board, a seasoned veteran? No. Uh, do you do you go with sort of just the uh, hey three really cool engineers in a room kind of model? Tell me a little about how you how you make decisions for investment. So it, it depends again in which vertical. So we have a lot of uh, things that are, for example, on the on the medical side. Uh, let's call it consumer medical side, and they are mostly focused on. What sort of data do you get to, to, to collect? So, for example, on, on the sun scope, um, we have lots of pictures of the inner ear of children, as it turns out. And it turns out you can diagnose all kinds of interesting, uh, uh, in interesting conditions from, uh, from, from that. Um, but no, you, you don't have to have everything figured out. It would be very unreasonable to assume for a seed investment or, or even a Series A. So it doesn't need to be a head of manufacturing and uh, um, the entire supply chain figured out and any of that. We have uh, um, one startup that we did recently, it's an MIT spin out, and that was actually literally this example, it was three engineers. Um, we try to help the company and guide the company then through this, uh, through this process. We try to augment this with our own recruiting, for example, in house, um, so we can find people. There's fortunately people in the community that can be helpful to, 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 to these startups. But no, you, you do not have to have all of this figured out. But you do need to have something actually differentiated and novel. Um, and ideally, for our taste, it should generate data that is not that easy to capture. And because we don't really want to be in a, in a hits business. Uh, we'll get to your questions in a minute. Um, so, you know, Kickstarter has been mentioned, Indiegogo as uh, both a valuable funding platform, <coughs> also as a, uh, as a way to sort of validate your market. So I thought maybe I'd, I'd get, uh, uh, I know Scott already mentioned it, but I had a couple comments on that. I, I thought I'd get everyone to uh, give me your uh, perspective on what's kind of the best way to take advantage of Kickstarter and what are maybe some, the Kickstarter platform and what are maybe some uh, gotchas to watch out for. Uh, I, I guess I could uh, go quickly. I think uh, a couple things that, that people have come to realize, and actually, most the, the best thing for me has been actually buying a couple Kickstarter projects and watching how they pan out. Um, the the things I think you would want to watch out for, one of the, I think everyone in this room will attest, is um, hey, I, I want to make a hardware device. I just raised $100,000. That's all I need to get this device built. 
He's laughing for a reason. <laughs> you need a lot more than $100,000, everybody in the room. You're off by a zero. Yeah, at least. Um, so, I mean, to give you an example, like, you know, you, you could easily spend sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 just for the injection tool, and that's where you put the plastic in for the product like this. Um, so there goes your money, and all you did was make a tool. You haven't, you don't have any logistics sorted out. You don't have your warehousing sorted out. You haven't even paid for your design and your engineering, let alone the actual cost of the goods. Um, so. I think the pitfall, a lot of people are falling and setting their, their bar far too low. Um, that said, I think that the smart ones are maybe using it as more like to, to what Scott said is, hey, no, notice us, and then they, they're going out and they're getting additional funding on top of that. Those guys are going to make it, um, or are going to have a much better shot, I should say. Uh, the second thing, and this is personal experience watching these poor guys struggle and struggle and struggle, is um, just because you really like something, doesn't mean you know how to build it. Um, and so the best example for that is, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the PID extro controlled espresso maker on, on the Kickstarter. Um, these poor guys are going on their second year uh, since securing funding and they still haven't delivered. Um, they really like coffee and they're really good engineers. Um, but they didn't realize that it takes you 90 days to get certified by UL. And UL is the thing that, UL is Underwriters Laboratory that you need to have to certify anything you plug into the wall in this country, or you should. Um, and uh, you, you really got to understand what you're trying to build before you try to build it. And lastly, to touch on, on, on that is um, certifications and compliance. Um, the CPSC has more money than it's had in 20 years. Uh, they are enforcing more heavily than they ever have in the history of the organization. It's um, the consumer product safety. I'm sorry, yes, I forgot. Yeah, I talked to them with the lingo. They're the guys who issue the recalls. Whenever you hear about cribs coming back, that's because a CPSC politely asked the manufacturer to. No one's ever actually told to. They're all always asked to. Um, and uh, they are enforcing more heavily than ever. And it, it will break your business. Um, you know, the, the, there's companies that have had battery problems. Um, a single battery recall can destroy your startup overnight. I mean, that can be, that can be a, a recall can be a million dollar problem. Um, and it doesn't really always correspond to how many pieces you sell. Uh, it, it's about the, uh, all the fines and everything you go through. So that would, be, that would be the things I would say to watch out for. But the, the one thing I, I just wanted to touch on Kickstarter really quickly I think is really interesting is that uh, Kickstarter is helping the rise of the startup, but Kickstarter is also, it's also like a self-perpetuating cycle. Scott touched on rapid prototyping. Kickstarter is creating rapid prototyping. Um, Google 3D printers on Kickstarter and watch how many hits you get. It's the most interesting thing in the world. The 3D printer was $3,500 five years ago. You can get one for 300 bucks now, thanks to Kickstarter. Um, and that's, I think, of something that wouldn't have happened without Kickstarter. I just don't see that, that being a market without it. So it's, it's really interesting. And that's going to continue. I think you'll see more, uh, more rapid prototyping coming through places like that. So. Uh, just a follow-up question maybe for Swin. Um, on the on the investment side again, is, is sort of having a successful Kickstarter campaign is that like a good thing? Um, do you well, already typically? Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know, so that's why I thought I'd ask. How, how how does that determine sort of how does that fit into your investment decisions? Would you recommend that early stage startups go through a campaign be, before they come to you, or how how do you usually see that? So we we tend to. First of all, we invest in Indiegogo, but I'll stick with Kickstarter for now. <laughs> um, um, we view it less as a funding mechanism and um, more of a market engagement mechanism. So um, we'd probably actually prefer it if um, we have a product that is already a little bit further along than have a Kickstarter campaign that is optimized <coughs> reasonably reasonable looking prototypes um, with a plan behind it, something that then isn't half a year delayed, um, and we use Kickstarter more as <coughs> an engagement mechanism than a funding mechanism. Um, that's <coughs> probably our preferred way. On a startup that um, did a Kickstarter, and the Kickstarter was phenomenally successful, we certainly noticed that, and people will bring it, uh, will, will bring it up. Um, but it is not the, the, the primary way. So for, for startups that we invest in at the, at the seed stage, we try to figure out a few things before we do it. Okay, thank you. Um, 
couple entrepreneurs in the room that are probably trying to figure out, okay, how do I get started? Um, where should I really take my uh, business? Should I, should I go straight to China? I mean, I think uh, probably all the panelists in the room agree <coughs> that at some point when you go uh, high enough on the mass market side, <coughs> you're gonna end up building in China. And the, the question kind of is, um, how do you get started? Uh, and uh, maybe I thought I'd, I'd give a couple of panelists sort of <coughs> their perspective on, on what you would uh, uh, recommend, either how to uh, go straight and engage in China and how would you go about it, or uh, you, you <coughs> drive over to Fremont and see Ken and, and all your troubles are solved. So that's... Um, <laughs> 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 so, and, and uh, Ken, maybe, maybe you could start it and maybe you can also tell us... Um, how, An unbiased point, answer. You know, what sort of your model I is, because I, I know when I first to talked to you, Ken, you, you, know, you were very out, up front and said, you know, I, I know, Stefan, eventually you're going to go over to China. And uh, I mean, that's just part of the equation. So how do you sort of, how would you advise a startup uh, when, that, when that shift over would happen? Um, well, it's, it's not always the same for, for every startup. But um, the things that, that China does well are usually the high volume production things. And the things that China doesn't do well are typically some of the things that you will need when you're starting your product out, like getting things done fast, doing iterations of design, um, having all those things happen within a time frame that keeps everybody uh, who's invested in the company happy. And it's often impractical to think that it's, it's, it can all be done in one place because one place may be specialized in one end of that spectrum and the other place could be specialized in the other. And that's, and that's really what the industry is. And I think even, even some of the larger contract manufacturers, people in my space that have headquarters here, doing the initial work at their NPI plant here uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to transfer very easily over to the high volume plants that they may have overseas. Because in, in reality, the organizations and the people and the systems that are involved in those two plants, even though they're the same company, are going to be greatly different. I, I would say you have to kind of understand your roadmap and make the right steps uh, and the right choices at each point in that roadmap. At the beginning, the choice may, may very well be, um, you know, I need to get this stuff done quickly. I need to make sure it works. I need technical help. Fremont's probably the answer. If I want to do 10 million of them, and I need to, and I, and I, I need to sell them in Asia, and I need to, I need to have you know, uh, very extreme price pressure. You should, you, de you definitely need to start kicking the tires early in China on that, but you may not want to engage until somewhere down the road when you've proven your market and you're ready to make that commitment. There will be a tremendous time commitment to going overseas. You may end up living there for a while while that factory comes up to speed to build your product. Because that stuff there does not happen as quickly as it happens over here. The scale does come at a price. And some of those prices are indirect prices. You're going to pay more for transportation. You're going to pay for some of your staff to be over there full time explaining the nuances of your product to people who have never seen it before and don't really understand your ideas. So it's important to understand where that roadmap is and where you need to start trying to engage that if you want to engage that at all. And uh, you're right, we have talked a lot about the consumer space and that, and that kind of transition is very typical in the consumer space. Um, and Sonic tends to be a front end for some of that stuff. We also have a lot of things that aren't necessarily the consumer space that stay here forever. So kind of figure out what your roadmap is. A good contract manufacturer will, will help you figure that out. Um, you know, like I said, our, our job is to be is to make you guys successful. We do serve uh, as a front end for a number of very large, you know, fortune whatever companies where we just do a series of transitional mm -hmm. programs with them all the time for factories that are gonna be, you know, building it in volume somewhere else. And a contract manufacturing company in Silicon Valley has to be used to that a little bit or else, or else they're drinking the Kool-Aid, I guess. Um, <laughs> because there's only certain things that still fit here and there's just a lot of other things that don't. We have, to have, we have to know where our place is. We have to work at defining where that place is when we're working with you. Okay, and uh, maybe Scott, uh, I'll give you that same question. Uh, I'm sure this is the number one question you get. You get uh, startups coming and saying, all right, so how do I get my product built? So tell me a little bit how you approach it. Um, yeah, so I think uh, Ken alluded to some something really important. He didn't address it specifically, but um, I, I will, which is the, the idea that 
you know, you want to have a very close relationship with who's building your product. Um, I always tell the startups that we work with, uh, that come to us with questions, um, any good manufacturer uh, that you want building your product, and it doesn't, this, most of what I'm going to say is irrelevant to which shore you're talking about, whether it's American mm -hmm. or, or Asian. Um, any good manufacturer, you need to pitch them. Um, you need to build a relationship with them, and you need to nurture that, that relationship. Um, and so the advice that falls out of that is, if you are very confident, um, for example, if you're, you don't have to have been a pebble and sold a bazillion of your things on Kickstarter or whatever, but if you're very confident that you're going to reach higher volume production, I would urge you to build um, one set of relationships because there's a tremendous investment in, um, in setting up that relationship, right? Putting um, the knowledge about your product, right, into your manufacturing partner. Um, it can, we, we frequently help companies um, transition either from one manufacturer in Asia to another because they got into trouble and they needed somebody you know, more capable or confident. Sometimes clients are coming to us having started in, in the U.S. and they're looking to go to Asia. Um, and it doesn't matter which direction you're going because um, it's not about the flag and, you know, on, the, on the yard of the factory. It's, it's the fact that any supply, supplier to you is a, is a relationship and it's something that needs to be invested in in and nurtured, <coughs> that takes a ton of time and effort, right? I'm sure Ken will tell you that his best clients are the ones that really put the effort into being there, putting their engineers in the factory, teaching them about the product so that they can get up to speed faster, right? It's not the companies that sort of throw a design over the wall and say, hey, you're, you're a manufacturer, it's your job, you go build it, right? I've specified everything. Um, that's not a good way to build a relationship. And so, um, Relationships with suppliers are just like relationships with your customers, your distributors, or your, your retail partners. And it takes a lot of time and effort to make it run smoothly. So try to start in the right place that's going to be the right place for you would be one of my pieces of advice. Because when you're a startup of five or 15 or even 25 people, um, as Mike said, he's a one-man band in, in the, the Lumo Manufacturing Department. Now, he gets a lot of help from, from us and from some other people. but. Um, at the end of the day, it, a lot of the decisions, you know, are going to fall to him. And so, um, you know, you don't have the ability to spend tons and tons of time moving, you know, well, we're going to make this piece here this week, and next year we're going to make it there, and next month we're going to switch it to this guy. You don't do that. You might buy your, you know, you might buy your next laptop from Amazon this year, and next year you might buy it from Fry's, but you don't do that in the world of manufacturing. So um, that's a real, one real fundamental thing that I think every entrepreneur needs to understand is that you need to know where you're going to go, right? As Ken said, some things should start in Asia, some things should start and should stay in the U.S. Um, I'm not here to wave any, anybody's flag, but um, I am here to always tell people, invest your energy wisely as a startup. You always have limited resources, both financial and talent, so consider that very carefully. As Ken said, kick the tires. Know who you're dealing with because whether the guys in, whether the factories in the U.S. are in, in another country, if you pick the wrong one, it's kind of like hiring the wrong person, right? The old saying, hiring the wrong person is often more costly than hiring nobody, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure you know who you're dealing with, and that's something in Zotac that we spend a lot of time helping people make those evaluations and kicking those tires. All right, and I also want to give uh, Mike a chance to <coughs> I mean, we had a conversation uh, that I still remember from a few months ago, I think it was during the interview, we interviewed you, and it was all about, um, you know, Mike spent a significant amount of time in China, and, and uh, maybe Mike, you can kind of describe to us sort of the <coughs> amount of manufacturing-related skill set that you see in that geographic area there. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think purely objectively, and again, not, not to, to wave a flag, because we, we are in manufacturing in the U.S. currently, uh, while we are, we're doing both. Um, one, of the, one of the strong advantages that, that you will get from China, um, and this is because of the, the way things have been over the last few years, is they always say China's not just cheap, it's fast. And China's fast because um, there's, if, if I'm doing, if, if I'm, if one of my components like this injection piece in, in molding, um, I'm doing, and he breaks, there's 10 other guys I can call, and they're probably within 25 miles who could do something similar. I mean, you know, at, at this level it's a little different, but just as an analogy, um, a specific example for us is we, we finish our product with a process called ultrasonic welding. They, you know, the piece comes down, it uses high frequency sound waves to melt the plastic underneath the top. It's actually pretty cool. Um, our guy who makes up for us in the US is in Illinois. 
the guy who makes it for us in China is, I don't know, what, five miles down the road from the factory? Um, and if he goes away, there's 10 other guys that do it. So that, that, is, a, that is an advantage when you go to scale. It, 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 there's this, that that skill set has moved, unfortunately. Um, and I think Ken, you probably yes. agree with this. In some areas, it's, it's gone. Um, there's, Very set. Yeah, there's not too many guys left who know how to make an injection tool in the U.S. Not too many guys who know how to make an ultrasonic welder in the U.S. They're all dinosaurs. They're all dinosaurs, that's right. Um, and so it, that, that, that skill set is, is over there. Additionally, if a part breaks or something goes wrong, there's, there's a lot of other suppliers immediately available. Uh, leaving aside the specific uh, microcontrollers and things like that, if your packaging supplier catches on fire one night, you've got another one down the road you can call up. Um, that is a distinct advantage, I will say, from years of doing this that, that China has over the U.S. Um, and that's only because manufacturing has moved. It used to all be that way here, um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's all moved now. So that's something to really, really consider. Is that you do have a you do have that that advantage when you're there. All right, and then um, I'll have maybe one last question, and then uh, start thinking about your own questions. We'll turn things over. Um, and this is more on the corporate side as well. You know, um, when we were building Lumo back, I mean, it's pretty clear we had very big, big goals in terms of the look and the quality that we wanted to convey to the user. But you know, you can pretty much tell the difference between something built by you know a hundred, uh, what Apple is worth these days, maybe a hundred billion dollars or whatever. Four hundred billion. billion. Okay. I mean, you can tell. Easily the difference, right? This is uh, just a beautifully crafted product. Uh, the iPod, uh, the latest iPod Touch, um, a lot of interesting materials. And here, you know, the the Lumobec, as as hard as we tried, you know, startup scale, uh, four or five people in a room, it's just really hard to duplicate. Um, so I always thought, well, you know, um, I think corporates probably have a big advantage in that space. The large corporations, they can do some really interesting things and, and work on some really interesting um, design. And just this week, I came across the, uh, the new Misfit Shine, which is a wearable sensor. And it sort of conveys, and it's a startup generated uh, uh, device uh, funded by Kosla, but it sort of conveys that same uh, feel that Apple conveys. Um, and I thought that was uh, quite significant. I, I haven't seen that yet, to where the packaging is as beautiful uh, and well thought out and beautiful, interesting materials as you know a four hundred billion dollar corporation can build. So, and then I started to think about the software space and, and looking at where's all the innovation coming from in the consumer space now in the software. It's all little startups working on little niche things that they're uh, developing for apps. All the consumer software companies, I was one of them, I mean, they're pretty much out of business or dying. Um, is that gonna happen also in the hardware? Is, are the huge innovations now gonna be driven by these smaller companies because of all the things we've talked about uh, in manufacturing is getting easier. Um, and uh, now you can build things at scale that used to be a $400 billion company that, uh, that uh, would require. So uh, maybe Swing, I know you had some thoughts on that. Maybe you can kind of weigh in on that. Is, is Apple doomed in, in that respect, or um, how how would you foresee the future? <laughs> I, I think it's rather dangerous saying things like Apple is doomed. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I, it's just that. So startups have different modes of operations than a large entity. Um, you don't go to a set of end committees to design something. You um, are a lot more flexible. You get to explore basically things that, if they were decided by a committee, would be regarded as being crazy. Um, so you, you have basically a bigger design space. But boy, can can an, uh, uh, an entrenched large corporate out execute you? And um, yes, ab ab absolutely. So that they're, they're just good at different things. Apple is one of the few companies that over long periods of time has been actually innovative. It's only recently that people have been maybe questioning this a, a, a little bit. But um, from the iPod to the iPhone to the iPad, that's an amazing string of innovation to string together for, for, for any large corporate. Um, that doesn't happen that frequently in, in large corporate. And so I think there's an opportunity for, for, for the startups, but once 
people have decided this is something that is indeed interesting and there is actually this consumer behavior that we didn't think existed, but now we also believe it exists. Um, yeah, they're going to come in too. And this is why we, we, we like things that have a platform aspect to them, that kind of binds people to a, to, to a particular, uh, to a particular but once they discover a particular user behavior and it's a large enough market for them to care, um, they, they will come in. Um, Nike, for example, Nike Fuel Band was not the first device that, uh, that came up. That was a wearable device, but just a, um, a, a large corporate that followed. Excellent point. Any other comments, or should we turn things over to the audience? <coughs> Let's hear that question. Okay. Yes. So, uh, some of you touched on it already in your comments, but I was curious to know, in terms of makers, you know, a lot of a lot of projects on Kickstarter, and actually today, a lot of manufactured products actually start off as hobby projects or as a niche product in a particular area. And I know that it's a big change about a year or two ago when VC started to pay attention actually to maker care and maker movement, because I remember if you go back three years ago, you just you didn't see anybody, you didn't hear from anybody. Now you have Mary Meeker at uh, Kleiner Perkins invested on the board of Quirky. Uh, there are lots of other examples I can give, but I want to know from each one of you, how closely are you related to, how closely do you watch the maker space? And, uh, and, and how do you see it in a longer term? Because it seems to be more and more a partner of industry as opposed to just a niche, you know, niche uh, hobby player. I, 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 well, I mean, I would say just from a personal standpoint, I watch it very closely. I think that there's, um, I, I think there's a tremendous amount of, obviously a tremendous amount of innovation, but I, I think these guys are the ones who, you know, if they're startups can imagine anything, these guys take it to the next level. Um, and what I touched on earlier, the advent of, of tools to be able for, for them to facilitate those projects are going, growing exponentially every year. Um, I talked to a, a guy who had a successful high-end robotics project on Kickstarter. And he's telling me, yeah, I had this laser cutter in my apartment. And I don't know if you've ever seen laser cutters. It used to be these things that took up rooms and were just incredibly dangerous and difficult to use. And I was like, wow, what did you pay for this? Well, I got it in China for five grand. I mean, someone can, someone can buy what used to be a NASA-grade component um, now for $5,000. And so I feel like those guys, the, the, there is no limit to what they're doing. And some of the stuff they're doing, they're doing is really exciting. Some of it's borderline crazy. <laughs> but uh, it, I, I personally, I think it's, it's a great space, and not being in the investment world, I, I still watch it very, very closely. I would say that it's certainly something that, that we watch. Um, I think you have to look very carefully at things that are, there's three categories of things that, that you see. There are hobbies, um, things that are never destined to become anything more than something you make for yourself and your friends. There are things that are good products. Then there are things that are actually companies, right? And then when you, whether you're spent investing in venture capital or you're ourselves sort of functioning as a venture engineering team, and we do invest in some of our clients and work for equity sometimes, um, we're looking for companies, right? We're not looking for products, and we're certainly not looking for hobbies. So um, to the extent that um, you know, there, there are some <coughs> products that, that ultimately can become companies or companies that ultimately evolve out of that, <coughs> what Mike's saying is, is the key point, right? Which is, it's easier than ever to go from sort of, I made one thing on a breadboard and, and I put it into a cardboard box in my closet and it does something funny when the doorbell happens to, hey, I actually have engineered something and I've got a, you know, my third generation prototype and now I can go pitch you know, to somebody who can either help me make it into a mass produced product or somebody who can help fund me to turn it into a scalable business, right? So um, there's no question that those things are more interesting now because it's much easier to get from those stages into something viable as a, as a business worth doing. I find it most interesting because it's this primordial zoo where you can run all these crazy experiments and you can find completely new user behavior that you wouldn't have expected if it were well planned and had to have a plan and a purpose from the very beginning. I agree, most of these things are not companies, or most of them I would say are not even products necessarily. Right. But um, so I, I, I really love that, that sort of ecosystem. Then again, I'm also a bit of a geek, so you might notice it says CTO there, so I have a um, tech shop membership, and my daughter and I go there and make things. So that, that, that that's maybe aside from that. But it's this really interesting primordial soup where you see things that you wouldn't see if they were well-planned products, and you see users reacting to it, and it gives you good, uh, good, good ideas. As far as uh, 
a major source of new deal flow. I'm not quite sure it's quite there yet, but I think there's definitely lots of really interesting ideas that come from that. Okay, um, let's uh, let's get to another question uh, in the back. Um, I just want to say thanks to Galva and Stefan for a great panel and really great uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. I know this is a hardware startup, but the, my question is really on the software side. Uh, I'm familiar with the EDA tools for semiconductors, but what kind of CAD CAM tools do you guys use in uh, doing your manufacturing or design for the hardware? Uh, just in, are you asking just in terms of like basically software packages that are commonly used? Yeah, like if you want to build the hardware with some uh, modeling, design, simulation, sure. what, what, what software tools would you use? Well, most people these days are starting to use SolidWorks. Historically, it was Pro Engineer. Um, there are certain industries, like the auto industry, is heavily concentrated in a package called Katia. But by and large, your sort of run-of-the-mill, you know, catch-all would be would be SolidWorks for mechanical design. Interestingly, they've just rolled out uh, an electrical design package as well, where there's a SolidWorks uh, electrical. I don't know if you guys saw that, but they just announced it, I think, very, very, very recently. Um, as far as electronic design, uh, schematic design and capture, board layout, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they would say there's a single.